Hey man, how you doing? I'm great, Bobby. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being on the show again for the second time. <laughs> how does it feel being the fastest man alive? Because you've been fasting. Uh, um well, I feel I feel a few pounds lighter. One thing. <laughs> um I can f- I can definitely feel there's little chafing between my thighs. Um, oh, that's good. Yeah, that's good. And oh, I, I, I had some ice cream like two nights ago, like the usual, um, like some walls, and it just tasted disgusting. <laughs> like my, like my, <laughs> my taste is my taste has been affected. And also, other yeah. than that, I, I've got I've since I've lost a few pounds, I see a figure coming together, just like my body taking shape. <laughs> Nice. nice. Mm. I I honestly thought like when I asked that question, you're just gonna like, okay, yeah, that's the end of the episode. I I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a special version, a special episode of Music Talks podcast. We are now on YouTube. If you're listening to this on YouTube, then you'll be watching us, uh, having fun like <laughs> recording. <laughs> But the version on Spotify is exactly the same content. The only difference is that you won't get to see uh, Mr. Arman Malik's face, which is good, bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, either way, you wouldn't be able to see Bobby's... Uh, well, he's not wearing shorts, is he? Are you wearing shorts? Uh, I think I think we can save that for later. You'll find out later. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Bobby Rose, and this is the Music Talks podcast. With me, I have... My friend, my very good friend from UITM, Mr. Arman Malik. Hello. He's back to talk about more about jazz. And how how you've been since the last time we talked? What was it like a few months? A, a month now? More than a month? Um. Yeah, I guess so. Like it didn't feel like a little more than a fortnight. Um. I'm feeling I'm feeling great. Um. I like we like we just mentioned earlier today. Um. Earlier in this recording, we. I did do some fasting, and today I'm on day eight. So within the within the past few days, I've managed to lo- managed to shed um three inches off my waist, and um, I'm feeling a bit lighter. Um, as of this morning, um, I was having some stuff shipped back from the UK, and I had my saxophone ah. like back. It was like my alto. I just got it back this morning, so it was great to unpack yeah. it and just really. Um, give it a blow. Like the reeds are a bit soft and old, probably because I've been playing my tenor a lot, and mm-hmm. I got a new mouthpiece for my tenor, which is great. So that way I can do more classical, um, perform more Train. classical repertoire. Oh yeah, yeah, that's good. <sighs> so um, what what I've been doing since the last time we talked is the like I kind of promised you. <laughs> And promise the <laughs> listeners is that I've been collecting like a bunch of questions. So with mm-hmm. me today, I have like four big questions. All right. And what's going to happen on this episode is we're going to s- possibly split up this episode into two different parts. Okay. Just because, um, yeah, it, it might take a bit too long. So are you ready to delve into the ep- uh, questions? Uh, sure. All right. So some uh, I've been having a discussion with some of my classmates and we were talking about you know we were learning about the history of jazz and Mm -hmm. uh starting with ragtime and then the blues and so on so um i I don't think we have enough time to for me to actually ask you what is jazz (laughs) fair enough (laughs) but but you know because it it uh, it covers all the stories from the um, uh slavery to the different forms of uh, cultural development you know in right. america and it's even like tied into multiple uh culture from africa and it- italy right mm-hmm. so I, I just wanted to just to get the ball rolling like the first question somebody right, actually then. asked and i actually have no idea like what's the right pattern of a swing like how do you differentiate swing bebop and double time pattern i mean like when you ask a uh, double basis. Hey, can you give me a, a swing like one, two, one, two, three, four? Ba doom, 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 doom. Okay. And then you just look at me and I'm like, 
But what is that really like the pattern, especially on your um, side? And okay, well that's a good that's a good question. Um, well to start off, uh, swing generally, generally it's essentially the the rhythmic um state the rhythmic mentality or sort of the pattern that you think about. Uh, generally about jazz so when you think straight ahead jazz or swing like or swing period let's say depression era um, jazz mm-hmm. you're thinking the you're thinking the pulsation of um to uh, of dotted you're thinking um triplets like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know um like crotchet quaver triplets so you're thinking becomes so generally um if we're talking with um, talking about swing, um, it can mean different things. Like, let's say if I were to walk up to a jam session and I asked them to play a swing, um, the basis, the double basses would play essentially a walking bass line in in quarter notes. Doom, 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 doom. So, to contrast that, the drummer would play the usual on the right or the hi hat. Yeah. And then, so how it diff how it differs from other from other departures of styles that other departure styles such as bebop uh, it's essentially the same it's swing but it's faster so with bebop um you are the swing pattern still there the trip mm-hmm. the 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 um division of qu- quavers the triplet mm-hmm. division of quavers is the same it's just faster in a sense that you could say it's a double time double time pattern so like I can just demonstrate it here. Um, All right, like it Let's might it, be a yeah. bit, might be a bit loud. So I'll just turn down the gain. Let's see. Sure, sure, yeah. All right, so let's see. So let's see. Let's see. I'll just play. Um, I'll just play something from swing. So, but so. <laughs> If, so you're thinking like so that's that's the feel of swing and uh-huh. um, to get it to bebop is sort of faster so instead so normal swing you'd be like quite relaxed one two a three a four a one two with bebop it's a lot faster like so for example on I I heard that line. I I know that line. (laughs) (laughs) It's the yeah. It's the first lines to Charlie Parker's solo on Coco. So you see, it's it's pretty much say it's just a matter of the difference is just a matter of um speed and also with bebop um drummers tend to are tend to take liberties with how they treat their snare and their um bass so they're not really timekeeping devices more like uh places in which to put like unexpected and, and unpredictable bombs like little accents here and there and it's not always the same so like mm-hmm. so it's just you you'll never know when he'll use the kick or the or the snare the differences are rather subtle the, whereas the um mm, compared to like like a standard rock band where everything is yeah. just you where the function is pretty much timekeeping and the only time you hear him take mm-hmm. liberties is in between fills is during fills so yeah those little, little answer, chops in the middle right mm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it, it does. Because um, uh, we we've been trying to understand like even if it marches because like the early jazz like way back in 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 nineteen ten nineteen twenty it started mm-hmm. with ching ka chang ka chang ka chang ka ching it's oh. you know it's it yeah uh, I think da 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 oh the march rhythms yeah Super. yeah I can I can I can actually elaborate on something about the early recordings the thing is um with recording technology at the turn of the century um with hold on let me just put my mic back up uh and consider mm-hmm. uh, concerning recording technology at the turn of the century it was pretty limited to how 
much of a band of how much of the range of frequencies you record, especially yeah. with drums, considering they at the time they were pretty loud. And when you were recording jazz musicians for the first time, they're probably not be, like a concept as like sort of playing to the room is probably unheard of since yeah <laughs> you since they have a since their background was in marching bands and you're always play, playing in public where there's no such thing as electrification amplification at the time mm-hmm. so a lot of times drums are often left out of the recording process so what you'd hear at, at the most they'll players. have like mm. yeah at, at most, most they'll have like a wood blocks uh yeah like hi hats um, just small small the set yeah the dish board ah uh, right? yeah 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 the scrubbing board and then mm. um but mostly the percussion if you hear in um let's say louis armstrong's hot fives and hot sevens recordings you'd hear mostly just uh, the strum of the banjo before the guitar came in it yeah. was the banjo giving being the um chordal uh the playing the function of the chordal player because you had essentially like a wrap of like sort of a snare on top of the body of the banjo so it acted uh-huh. as that so it had that sharp percussive sound without it being too overtly brash yeah that that's the mm. that's the strike the chuck thing chuck thing mm. yeah yeah but then but and now with now that recording technology is advanced you can go back to um rec- records like i was checking out um a clarinetist named evan christopher He's a mm-hmm. clarinetist. He's a New Orleans clarinetist, well versed in um, the New Orleans uh, style of jazz. Um, so, so in those recordings, you can actually hear what the drums would would have sounded like back in 1900s, where you had uh, mostly it was just a boom, tsk, boom, tsk, boom, tsk, boom. Tsk. So the yeah. the 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 bass, the kick drum, you'd hear a lot. So it was the second line pattern you'd hear. So it would sound like boom. So you had you still had that hi hat on the two and four, so I think mm-hmm. that has never um, that has never um, eluded uh, jazz timekeeping. Yeah, and uh, I I like how you like just like went into that pattern because I I don't know maybe it's that pop side of me like every time people just sing that uh pattern uh it's it's also um uh prepare for battle fit fit to battle there's a there's a Mm. So that uh, that drums that drum line is also like. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's a lot that, of. Mm-hmm. It, it's just oh, right there, and of course, the more familiar one is all the single ladies, all the single. Ladies. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's quite that's quite interesting. You made that parallel because um, when we go back to that second line march beat, you have mm-hmm. to th- think of the context in which um you have to remember that. With jazz, it evolved from all kinds of styles, and as well as the African element that was brought in, yeah. blended with the European elements like the boom, tss, the boom. Tss. So, like drum, like for example, it was from a so a lot. Jazz comes from marching bands, the rhythms of ragtime, and then the blues, the blues of the Mississippi, Mississippi Delta, the percussions of Congo Square. It's pretty much like a coming together of all these musical styles, and the European element. Um, comes from the instruments that were left during at the by the end of the civil war um a lot of there was there's a strong um there's a strong marching band tradition in it that it dates back to the military um the military tradition of how mm-hmm. you know wars were w- wars were fought and music was used as a fun- as yeah. a function in a way to just symbolize um the beginning or the end or how um how to direct and communicate between soldiers mm. and with yeah and the ragtime i mean going back to that hi hat on the 2 and 4 it's it goes back to that left hand where left hand on the ragtime piano where the first where on the downbeat you got the guys playing the bass and on the upbeat it's the chords like boom chak boom chak doom chak and oh like i could go on but it it's it's really fascinating that like Jazz is basically a coming together of all those elements, and then to hear it again yeah. come out in Beyonce, that's just yeah. insane. <laughs> yeah, but but it's sad that when when people think like jazz, like that's the first thing that their their minds will go to. You know, like that it it's more of that than what it's supposed to be traditionally. Mm-hmm. But I guess that's the that's the music program. That's more of the music students training. 
Now, oh, yeah. what about what about the Latin side? What about the South American Latin side? Like somebody actually asked me like, what's the bossa pattern? What's the samba pattern? Because I was trying to gauge like, a, okay, swing is like right here. Doesn't matter mm-hmm. if it's swing or bebop or a double time like ting 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 ting. But then bossa has that um ting 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 ting. So the the drums will play the ting 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 ting. But if it's samba, people just say it's people say it's, it's just double time. Ding chaka 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 ding chaka ding. In Spain, I still love and adore you. Ding ding chaka 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 ding. But even um samba pattern is not played. Mm-hmm. All the time, just because uh, a score like Spain is written mm-hmm. samba, it, mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that you still play that. Pop, 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 at least on the rhythm instruments. So right. even even the drums will just play something as closer to pop in my perspective, closer to pop mm-hmm. than it is to samba. Yeah. So uh-huh. what what are your thoughts on that one? Um, I think I believe um there should be I think over time and like. In prepare in preparation for the future, um, I think it should be clear. It should be made clear that there are distinct um, differences between um, bossa, between um, Brazilian music and Afro-Cuban music. So what you had just mm-hmm. mentioned were the sub sub styles of Brazilian music, i.e., bossa, bossa and samba or bossa nova, because yeah. um, a lot of times I feel like it's easy to it's for for people not well versed in um, musical styles it's easy to confuse the two different um to do dif- the two different latin cultures especially between especially between um afro cuban and brazilian because with bossa nova it's essentially a pattern that that was made popular during the 60s it's essentially called bossa nova which translates to new wave in portuguese so bossa oh. nova Bossa yeah. Nova, it's essentially a style where um, the clave is more distributed as opposed to the montunos, as as opposed to the um, Afro-Cuban claves of two three and two four. So with yeah. um, so with boss, so you have a difference between so like let's say a salsa, a clave you would hear on the salsa, let's say um, bet- between two a two three clave in um, Afro-Cuban tradition, you'd hear. Mm. And then, yeah. Uh-huh. Whereas um, bossa a bossa clave would be more laid out back, like oh wait, sorry, that was wrong. Um, one, two, three, four. Yeah, all, all the right? upbeat, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah, yeah. So three. I mean, there's there's also those subtle differences in three, two, and. Two three, uh, but in the context of bossa, mm-hmm. it's pretty much laid back, and it o- it also goes it goes without saying that um, the the sound and the language of the music is also go- runs parallel with the language of which that music is native to, especially with um, mm. so in this case Brazilians. So bossa nova, it's a relatively it's a relatively young it's new style, and I'm pretty sure it evolved out of um, what came what came before it there were there was pretty much brazilian music before but i don't think it has made widespread it's made widespread in term as much as what it is now um yeah. as in like bo- what we know as bossa nova and as for samba it's essentially bossa nova but twice as fast it's like sw- it's like what um traditional swing is to bebop so samba yeah. is basically bebop for sw- uh some uh bossa yeah but even even then, it's quite confusing for me because in in my head, actually, if if anyone asks me what's the what's the what's the clave not the clave what's the ostinato what's the repeating pattern what's the constant in in both these samba bossa patterns it's like actually it's just the tumba wo oh yeah because that's where the bass meets the drum set it's just like I I don't care I can be like but at the end of the day it's just right here. Oh, yeah. So that's why it gets kind of blurred, and well, mm-hmm. you, even then, uh, when when we talk about salsa and all all these, ding, tuck, tick, ding, ding, tuck, ding, 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 tuck, mm-hmm. so it, that these um blurring blurring lines between the different patterns, mm-hmm. what's up? Ha- what's up with that? Like, 
wouldn't that make a lot of things like tougher or are they what it is is it what oh, it, it is in terms so you're saying what why so you're asking why is there why is there suddenly uh, why are there musicians um blurring the lines between the distinct styles of bossa and samba is that what you're asking yeah. bossa samba and and all the like <clears throat> like the multiple multiple different patterns okay well um there's two well i could i could go two ways with this uh one um one probably cultural ignorance because mm-hmm. essentially you would ju- you would just put things together that you don't really understand how how to you you would just put your limited understanding into your own music so in a way it's it it sort of it sort of um culturally misinforms listener your mm-hmm. listeners and it also disappoints and it would also draw the ire of um people who are well versed in that style but or it could be deliberate in a sense that you you know the styles and you're trying to come up with something different something new by blurring those lines so a lot of people are doing that they they you'll you'll see both of these you'll see both of these kinds of people um making music but essentially you'd want to end up being the latter in a sense that you know what you're doing and you're drawing the best styles from from each so uh, i can only give you two i can only fathom two reasons why you would hear the blurring of the blurring of distinct differences between boss and samba cultural <laughs> ignorance but also the op- the polar opposite which is cultural acknowledgement and yeah. knowing how to come up with something different and i i guess more often than not we would we would wish it's the second one yeah you wish that yeah but obviously it's um yeah the the majority will always be like they just it feel it sounds nice it sounds good mm-hmm. i, I don't mm-hmm. care like i'll i'll just call my song whatever it is because i know the day it's still my song or his song that her song yeah fair enough <laughs> fair enough so in in your studies do you find that there's some mix or uh of patterns like any patterns that coincide with malaysian patterns because i i know like the only thing that at the top of my head like when it comes to like jazz patterns or, mm-hmm. or, or traditional pattern I, i i don't even know what it's called anymore like patterns like <laughs> are like similar to malaysian patterns just because of the descendants is because of the roots is um right. that portuguese joget because even oh, the portuguese okay. joget is similar to that uh indian raga uh, mm. in indian ta- to actually ting cheta ting ting cheta ting ting cheta that that joget uh joget okay. pahang joget malaysia yeah. so uh, uh, what about like the jazzier patterns do you think that any of them are like similar to malaysian patterns Or, or maybe the other way around. Huh? Like, is there any jazz patterns that eventually found its way into Malaysia, and you know, like we translated it into our culture? Um, okay, that's a good question, actually. Um, well, I hate to disappoint you, but I don't think I've ever come across um any drummers in my in my circle or like in my university that has ever um taken anything that resembles Malaysian. Uh, Rabana patterns like let's say let's just draw on our mutual experience with uh, Rabana like mm-hmm. in traditional in traditional mu- Malaysian music class back in UITM mm. so yeah. um, I was just listening to um, you remember you remember a um, good friend of ours Kidrul Kidrul Adil he was yeah, like one of yeah. the first uh-huh. yeah one of the first and his um, main main instrument is Rabana is like oh, Malaysian percussion Malaysian percussion So he was essentially just re- going th- he basically did something on his Insta story where he filmed himself with the rabana going through different um different of the substyles we l- went through like the inang the masri and the joket mm-hmm. and like I was listening to that and thinking whether it went back if if whether it drew any um parallels with what I came across in jazz and unfortunately not that much because what I hear a lot in the european tradition of jazz in the european um innovations made to jazz uh they they mostly take from um i they mostly take from the celtic or the norse music styles mostly european stuff and then oh, yeah. let's say yeah and instead of let's say we're doing um like let's say we're doing like a medium tempo standard we wouldn't be using a swing pattern we'd pr- they'd probably <laughs> use less of the right symbol 
and less rith- less of the established rhythms and come up with something else like i remember doing a um i remember doing a chord what was it i was doing a um i was doing a coldplay um i was doing a coldplay recording coldplay songs for my recording project and mm-hmm. instead when of using the you- usual <laughs> <laughs> when, when aren't you I? doing a Coldplay recording? No, just kidding. Keep going. <laughs> so, like the lineup was pretty much a jazz quintet, but then uh, my drummer he was using pretty much less of what you'd expect in a rock band, and it was just pretty much there's there's a common language that you hear you you probably pick up from drummers of today. So he was using less of the snare, mm-hmm. and then I remember everything just sounded so subtle so in a sense that you had to listen for them rather than actually um play them out directly it was less like profound and more just it's 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 more like a um it was more like like how it was like a sketchbook rather than a detailed finished painting mm-hmm. yeah, yeah so back to uh, malaysian patterns um when we listen to our when we listen to early recordings of the 50s when rtm when after the after independence after malaya gets its independence and Malaysia is slowly coming together. Um, RTM, when it was coming together, it had people like um, the Solianos. It had yeah. Jimmy Boyle. Jimmy Boyle. It had um, what was the name of the what was the name of the most the regarded pianist from Penang? Um, it was uh, a Chinese. Uh, Chinese pianist. Uh, I can't remember. So, oh, it man. was. I think it was like Ui Beng or something like that. Yeah. I- I, yeah. I really I really don't want to try. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that there was but, that. Yeah. Essentially, so what we were what they were doing was what they tried doing was putting together and codifying what was traditional Malaysian music repertoire, like pretty much like a like what what our what the current cats and KL are doing with the Malaysian real book, except we didn't mm-hmm. really have a real book. Yeah. So yeah. what they did was. They were these guys were well versed in classical music and jazz music, and jazz, like surprise, surprise, surprise. They, they also had knowledge of Malaysian folk songs. But then, to really make it to really establish Malaysia's musical identity as its own, as its own unit, they had to abandon the 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 no, their existing knowledge of jazz. Um, the Afro-Cuban L- jazz, whether it's swing or the Afro-Cuban um, sub-styles. So they went about implementing um, patterns f- date from the Rabana, from the Gendang tradition. So a lot of times when you hear a Malay folk song, you'd hear it in the style of an Inang or a Masri. Yeah. There is hardly any, there's hardly any indication that, like any inkling that it was ever originated from jazz. The harmonies were definitely, but certainly not the rhythm. Okay. So. The, the, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I guess. It, yeah, I, I guess in that sense we still have a quite a, a long way to go. But I do remember having a conversation with you like way back when, which actually brought me to this question. Like, there mm-hmm. was a random conversation you and I had back in our mm-hmm. diploma days. Like, mm-hmm. uh, you know that pattern though. That mushy pattern. Yeah. What if we just like, like the hi hat would be shuffling, but then the 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 that bass and snare would still be going. Yeah. And yeah, I guess uh, it's more like like it's like taking um the sec- the New Orleans second line march beat. You put on yeah, the mus- yeah, It's yeah. pretty much filling in the gaps that the New Orleans beat left. So. I I don't I don't see a problem or I don't see I don't think I mean I don't think it's ever it's a problem of ever happening it's it's actually it actually sounds pretty pretty neat but then yeah it also from what you were just just demonstrating it does sound like it does cross over into a bit of zapin from what I heard yeah 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 actually that's true <laughs> that's true <laughs> so going from there um there was this there is this research done by uh, a UPM senior. Uh, Wong mm-hmm. Xiao En, that actually, she looks up into the jazz studies by, mm-hmm. sorry, the 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 programs undergone by Malaysian okay. s- students, and a lot mm-hmm. of Malaysian students can't fathom the idea that there's a 
unspoken rule in jazz. Like what okay. is right and what is wrong. And mm-hmm. people always say, oh, you know, just... Uh, okay, play the melody. And then you solo whatever you mm-hmm. want. But it's not right. really solo whatever you want. So yeah. then they would be, you know... Because um, not only Malaysians, like Asian countries, we tend to like, oh, we don't want to mm-hmm. do anything wrong. So we're just going to stay here. But then when you're only like, okay, RPGs and a bit of scaling here. The other people are just like, oh, right. keep going crazy. And then they go crazy. But then that's wrong. So... There's, yeah. What, what what's up with that that like unspoken rule? Oh, okay. So what are the unspoken rules of, let's say, let's put it in the context of um the unspoken rule of the jam sessions. Is that right? Uh, the uh, of jazz itself, like more specifically, the unspoken rules of soloing of actually um playing the wrong things whenever you want to. Is that oh. even a wrong thing to play? Actually? Um, if well, in I mean. There are rules in jazz as there are in the classical European tradition. So mm. in jazz, I mean, it's pretty black or white. There's, there's no, there are gray areas, but if it's wrong, if it's unintended, if it's unintended, but it, it is technically, technically right, it's wrong. If it's unintended, <laughs> but it was supplies, if, if it's unintended, but it was pleasantly right, then it's right. You know, there, there are those yeah. subtle differences, but if you play it wrong on purpose, and you and you don't have any knowledge yet. It's wrong. Um, there are. I'm, I remember going through. I remember going to classes, like learning tunes. And I remember so. Remember my, one of my teachers actually asked me to solo over a certain standard. And he like at the end of the mm. at the end of the lesson he was like, you know, during your solo there were a lot of, there were a lot of things that you were playing that were wrong. But then because of your conviction, they actually sounded right. And I was like, what the fuck? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I I guess. It co- it boils down to just your your you're genuinely feeling what you're playing. You're genuinely feeling it, but then um, there are times where you get so creative that it overrides the harmonic structure. So, in a sense, you're respecting the spirit of jazz, but you're also but also you're not regarding or respect in a sense regarding the harmonic structure or sort of like the fundamentals. So you're attempt you're essentially attempting to go above it. Yeah, so, and even yeah. even in that sense, you're still respecting the spirit of jazz, right? Mm-hmm. Because even the spirit of jazz is like is the idea of uh, going against uh, the rules. I mean, not breaking the rules, but you know, like mm-hmm. going against the norm, uh, yeah. trying to break out of whatever oppression. So even disrespecting mm-hmm. jazz is still respecting jazz because um, you're de- yeah yeah. Uh, in a way, because in a way, my in a sense that my um, maturity as an improviser at the time, it is essentially like what a child is to an adult. So, I could be I could be right in the spirit. I could be right spiritually, but in terms of getting the vocabulary, I'm still I wouldn't have been there been gotten that bit together. So, part of okay, let's talk about the jazz. Let's talk about um, the unspoken rules and the laws of uh, the of the jazz jam session. So because okay. what the thing about jam sessions is it's a way of it's a coming together of musicians of the same of the same culture and it's a way of pitting yourself against the experienced and also the inexper- also the inexperienced so with before there's even so with improvising it's not really improvising in the, in a sense that you're spontaneously playing whatever comes out of your horn there mm-hmm. is the jazz tradition is steeped in in the the amount of preparation that you make before you even get to the stage even co- before you even come to the club so like there's there's at least few things you got to prepare at least a dozen things you got to prepare you got to be able to know how to play your instrument technically well yeah. that's mm-hmm. one you got to have a good sound like a good sound that at l- something competent that everyone agrees with a constitutionally agreeable um Mm. timbre like Mm -hmm. speaking speaking as a saxophonist uh, speaking as a horn player and also at least knowledge of three tunes meaning not knowing not just knowing how to play the melody but also knowing its form the structure and also where also the harmonic structure like which chord Mm. which chord functions where are the two fives where are the turnarounds Um, 
which basically knowing knowing the song inside out so at least three three tunes because i mean if if there's one per if the same person is calling like three tunes that I, i'd say that's greedy so <laughs> okay one okay that's that's one thing with with in the jam session you must be pre- you must be prepared and you must be generous you mm-hmm, must mm-hmm. share the music so the jam session is about sharing and mm-hmm. showing where you are in terms of like basically drawing a musical shape of whether yeah. whether you are gone whether you're up the ranks or not um and then so going to the club okay going to the club going to the jam session someone calls a tune you got to be able to know how to play it okay another thing do you want to play in swing do you want to play it in bosa do you want to play it in the style yeah. of the samba your, your so vocabulary. you got to have exa- exactly you got to have knowledge on how to improvise in different rhythmic contexts as well mm mm-hmm. mhm So um that's why the first two that's why the first two years of my ja- of the jazz course in Birmingham is so much about preparing yourself as an instrumentalist like knowing how to best serve your role whether you're a bass player a drummer or yeah, yeah. a pianist or yeah or a horn player like myself so and then when we get to going going on the stage and playing you sort of have to when you call the tune you be at, you, you of course have to be able to know how to play it and then when we get to soloing okay mm-hmm. when you get to soloing the best bet is your best bet at most is two choruses if we're talking a standard tune if we're talking a blue if we're talking a blues yeah do at least five don't don't hog the fucking like don't hog the fucking stage at an average tune on on a jam session should be no more with no more than 10 minutes 7 to 10 7 to 10 minutes not one If person it, <laughs> not one person yeah one person should not hog should not have like 30 choruses that's that's ridiculous even if he can yeah. play well because what you're doing is essentially like essentially you're just showing off and then two you're disrespecting the ta- you're disrespecting your other fellow musicians who are probably like especially the rhythm section who has been keeping time for you this whole time ta- mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. throughout the whole throughout your solo and the other musician the other horn players who are waiting their turn i mean yeah. heck if you're the guy first guy soloing and you're hogging it all and you're not uh, till like even pass is like the worst case where this guy's not proficient he knows the song but when he solos his improvisational knowledge in jazz is not as it's not as um virtuous and to the point where he can no longer musically build for after after a climax and he's yeah, just really yeah. hogging space then that's pretty that's just that's just not cool so so basically when when you feel when you feel like you've gotten to a point where you've contributed where you've said something at least like just mm-hmm. a simple um, let's say two choruses at most where you've actually developed and just finished with your musical statement or your whole idea in that solo that's when you pass it on to the next one and you have to cue someone you have to let let the guys yeah. know that you're ending it yeah. so you got you got to talk mm, you, you got to like, yeah essentially communicate whether verbally or non-verbally like a mm-hmm. lot of times like like it's okay when you go to the head when people say going back to the head or back to the top of the song meaning we finish it a lot of times I have a french rap player just do this like just yeah. tap the tap is No, Bobby's we're not head. flipping you off. <laughs> <laughs> hey Bobby, hey Bobby, you remember 3 4? No, please don't. <laughs> I I do. To answer your question, I do remember. <laughs> But just to uh continue on on what you said, wouldn't that be more of um wouldn't the bigger question to what you were talking about be uh, the mm-hmm. function of music, the function of the performance? I I mean like a lot of people seem to have the misconception that when jazz performers solo oh mm-hmm. okay these are my thoughts everybody sit down and listen so right. i'm going to take especially um well it uh, i take it a bit more personally because like uh, when drummers solo like if you right. go on youtube and you actually watch these 10 minute drum solos 15 minute drum solo you can clearly mm-hmm. see like the 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 and then all the uh, band players will just leave the stage because okay mm-hmm. This is the drummer. It's like just taking mm-hmm. the whole stage, yeah. Because that's right. really his time. But mm-hmm. when you're talking about it, you're talking about the original spirit of jazz, where you are having a discussion. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, yep. this girl from Ipanema, and then how I solo is oh no 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 not this girl from Ipanema. There's actually a girl from Penang that I like, and then you're mm-hmm. talking about oh yeah, but uh, there's actually this girl from Ipanema, but he she's staying in Kuching. But we're all talking about the same topic, but we're discussing okay. rather than mm-hmm. oh you know what you guys are wrong, y'all should mm-hmm. sit down. <laughs> I'm going to tell uh-huh. you about the real girl from Ipanema. So yeah, oh. I, I guess. Okay, so you're asking essentially. How does it? How is a drum solo connected to the language? Of no, I, I, mean? I'm just talking about the. It, it's more of the function of music. It, it's more about the function of a, the purpose of the performance. Like, are you trying to be there with the band? Are, are you like a, uh, you know the, Arman Malik trio or the Bobby Rose Bobby Rose trio, or is mm-hmm. it just like okay, this is the Bobby Rose highlight, and and his friends. You know okay. what I mean? Because I, yeah, personally, I I I feel like it has a much a a bigger uh, a a wider connotation, a different connotation when you say like Arman Malik and friends, mm-hmm. rather than if if the three of us like okay the unhatched boys. Oh you know? okay. If, yeah. So, oh, so going back to when you were talking okay. about the solo, like passing the solo around, that mm-hmm. means you're you're doing it as a band rather than just okay mm-hmm. this song is all you. This tune is all you, you know what I mean? Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's different. Um, jam sessions are essentially a coming together of um, various musicians where we treat it on an equal plane. If you're talking like a, if you're talking like a quartet under my name, and mm-hmm. I'm the band leader, then of, then naturally I would take at least two or two or three choruses more than my than my sidemen. So yeah, mm-hmm. there is there's it's also it's also a um. How do you say this? It's it's sort of like, yeah, it's sort of a commercial thing because if if it's under your name, you should be the one that's more highlighted. So of, so naturally, what comes after that is you yeah. take certain solos, but the, like like especially if we're talking if we're talking like extended solos, like you see what happens with um, like you see what happens with uh, Art Blakey and Buddy Rich, and we're yeah. basically talking about yeah we're talking about drummers who have big bands on their bill on their name. Yeah. Like let's say Buddy uh-huh. Rich, of course he, of course he takes like, you know he take he takes forever to play a solo just to show off how how great he is. So, so yeah, it, it's natural for it's natural for drummers to just for drummers or soloists who are band leaders to stretch their legs a bit longer than the people they employ, um, or let's say like Orin or like like the Brecker Brothers. I mean, mm-hmm. it's obvious. So the key players are Michael, uh, the saxophonist and trumpetist Michael, and his brother Randy. Yeah. Or um, if we're talking, or if we're talking T Square, okay, the uh-huh. Japanese fusion culture, um, you'd have Masato Honda on par with the guitarist. I wish I knew their names. The guitarist <laughs> and the keyboardist. They're all get taking equal lengths, and the Jap- and the way that Japanese approach jazz, it's is a lot different to what people in the states and what the people in Europe do in a sense that Japanese are really well sorted they play music that is just listenable that's likable easily tuned yeah, yeah, tune yeah. like yeah. whereas whereas vanilla. european yeah very vanilla whereas european whereas europeans like to blur the lines and just sort of like it's like um it's like the difference between taking a sakura cherry coke and trying to put like oak in your beer Oh man, I I can't even relate to both of those. So, <laughs> <laughs> but even when you say it that way, like it it's still um not a fair distinction because when you say like you're comparing like uh the Western world to the Asian world, but then I, I respect I love uh Stevie Wonder's performance because he'll call like okay I have like fifteen players behind me I'm gonna call out each and every one of you. On the guitar, on the saxophone, on the bass, on the keyboard, on the other guitar, that that mm-hmm. percussion guy. So like that that spirit, that um, esprit de corps. You know? mm, that yeah. collective. Basically, you want to highlight every one of your yeah. every one of your assignment. Uh, there are people like that for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, Stevie Wonder is a good example. Um, no, not Jacob Collier. I don't think that's a good example. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was just passing. It was passing through my head. Yeah. Uh, Michael League. Michael League is a good example. Like he he can lead Snarky Puppy, but nobody yeah, yeah. would know that. Nobody would know that Michael League is Snarky Puppy. 
Yeah. Because he, and, he until at the end of the music video, then you say, mm-hmm. oh, it's composed by or arranged by. Oh, okay, then you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there are so it's it's pretty much free. It all it all depends on what you really want to do, and it but in fixed cons in fixed contexts like commercial, like commercial con like commercial um concerts or jam sessions. Jam sessions, everyone's equal. If we're talking about a band leading a band, it's up to it's it's at the band leader's discretion on who he wants to highlight mm-hmm. on who and what kind of music and which of his personnel he wants to highlight. Like uh, let's like like yeah. uh, Dave like Dave Brubeck's like Dave Brubeck's quartet. He Take Five was essentially just a feature for Joe Morello to play in five four on the drums. Or yeah. when um or with okay, the Jazz Messengers. Now Art Blakey is not the star. He is he is essentially Grand Elder or the Grandmaster to the people to the up and coming musicians which are the messengers. Oh, the messengers yeah. are the star. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's true. So like and then because of that band, because the when we think of the band, we don't just think of Art Blakey, we actually think of like he features himself so so very little like like his tunes are probably Night in Tunisia and mm-hmm, Blues March mm-hmm. Night in yeah. Tunisia and Blues March those are the only two um no memorable tunes that Art Blakey would feature on but when yeah. it comes to everyone else because of the Jazz Messengers everyone knows who Hank Mobley is everyone knows who Lee Morgan is who Benny Golson yeah. was Freddie Hubbard Wayne Shorter Curtis Fuller oh, yeah. uh Cedar Walton like it's the it's the messengers. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Mm. And even when you Google like Art Blakey, like the first tune that uh, uh, most likely will come out is "Morning" by Art Blakey oh, yeah. and the Jazz Messenger. But even then, he he doesn't. There's no like um, uh, virtuosic drum solo by Art Blakey. But mm-hmm. it's that's the highlight. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. Yeah. And that record, it's, it's so iconic because it's Bobby Timmons, the pianist at the time was yes. Bobby Timmons. Yeah. And then. You have, but the most iconic, memorable thing about Monin is that trumpet. So is how Lee Morgan starts that trumpet solo, in a sense that on every live date that they perform Monin, it has to be started that way. So in that oh, in yeah. itself, legit with repetition, legitimizes it as a uh, sort of like a sub tradition. Oh, nice. Yeah. Right. Okay, so right before we end this episode, right, mm-hmm. because. Uh, we've been going through a lot of questions and there are like another big chunk of questions so before we end I just wanted to ask the last small topic alright we've been talking a lot about soloing and you know the mm-hmm. differences between like you know, the in international waters and in our local scene is right. it actually a foreign thing to Malaysians since we are not always the first one to like talk or express ourselves I mean like a lot of people people like you and I We'd mm-hmm. be okay in, in right. like somebody asks and somebody wants to just like, or oh, you want to come up on stage and introduce us. We, you and I, we would. And there are a lot of people mm-hmm. that would. But right. for people who are more introverted, more mm-hmm. insecure, they, mm-hmm. they don't really want to like stand out. And because of that, it might actually translate onto the jazz play. And they can't really solo that well. Do you find that that is true? Or am I just thinking, am I just uh, limited in um it's sort of it's well i mean i get what you mean but you'll find that there are a lot of insecure there are a lot of people who find um who abandon their insecurities when they play uh like let let's take Jimi hendrix for example like even mm-hmm. like okay blues musician but a musician nonetheless he i read in a biography by his brother uh, leon in that he was brought he he was doing this um he came back to his hometown to do a concert in his in his former high school yeah. and like he was asked to give a speech but naturally he wasn't able he's not he's rather he's a rather withdrawn um introverted person uh hendrix jimmy so oh. instead he just s- expressed whatever he wanted to say with the guitar like in- yeah. like instrumentally because it was something that he was always doing and he of course he went through he was going through um like he was raised in a very he was raised with a very strict father and like you know cut, like when you come from an abusive family you tend to withdraw within to yourself so with yeah. jimmy although he was introverted 
he found that he could totally express himself uh with without without fear of um without fear of um scrutiny through the guitar yeah. like through through music so essentially so to answer your question no it does not how you how you carry yourself in public in public speaking does not necessarily translate into uh music oh okay that's that's yeah. that's good to hear because i always find more often than not like even when uh, i have friends like holding on to a saxophone holding on to a trumpet and it's like mm-hmm. when when i'm just looking at them and they're like no <laughs> maybe because they they're, they're not there yet so mm-hmm. yeah so that that's the end of our first episodes uh we still have another episode to go and for those of you listening online we thank you for tuning into this episode and we'll see you on the next one all right thank you so much